Hi, in this video, we will demonstrate calculating the electric field by integration over a half ring. So this is a question from your homework, and it's an excellent example for illustrating two things. One, some of the considerations you have to give in direct calculation of electric field. And two, this is an example where you can calculate the electric field by using Gauss's law. There isn't enough symmetry in the setup. So let's get started. What we are going to use is Coulomb's law, which says that electric field over point charge is given by the Coulomb constant times the charge divided by distance squared. So you might wonder then, in this setup, isn't the distance all r? So couldn't I say electric field at point P is Ke Q divided by r squared? Now, this is what you have to worry about. You have to worry about the directions. So let me start by imagining breaking up this half ring into tiny little pieces. You will see what I mean when we do that. So starting from the end, I'm going to imagine breaking this up into tiny little pieces. Keep going. And then let's take this as our representative segment eventually. And then keep going and divide it up here too. Now, I hope you are beginning to see what I mean by you have to worry about the directions. Electric field is a vector, which means the contribution to the electric field from this segment of the charge pointing away this way, and the contribution to the electric field from this segment of the charge pointing away this way, they point in different directions. So if we simply say that electric field at point P is given by KQ divided by R squared, you can expect that result to be correct because you have ignored the directions. There will be some horizontal components that are going to cancel out. So we have to do the proper calculation. Now, there are different approaches we can take here. There's a super formal approach, which we can do, but I won't. Let me present to you with a slightly more intuitive approach here. This is the representative segment that I'm going to use, that is a charge d cube. And we broke it up into such a small piece that the angular size it casts, called that d theta, is very small. So the contribution to the electric field from all of this portion of the segment will be mostly going in the same direction. This is the small infinitesimal contribution to the electric field from that segment. Now, the super formal approach would be to take this as a vector quantity, express its uh, x and y components in terms of some parameterization that you can pick and just uh, chalk through the integral. We can do that, but let me illustrate a slightly more intuitive visual approach. It's what's called pairwise cancellation. It's uh, in recognizing some remaining symmetry in the setup. Let me show you what I mean. I am going to draw this vertical auxiliary figure to help us see what I want you to see. And we have chosen this piece as the representative piece here. Let me label it DQ1 because it has a matching piece on the other side. Imagine a mirror image version of that piece here. I am going to call that DQ2. This piece will contribute its own electric field. And what is nice here is that once you draw these two electric field vectors, you can see that the horizontal components are going to cancel out. So the only component you have to worry about is the vertical component for the addition of these two vectors. And because of the symmetry in the setup, you can find these pairs for any charge element along this half ring. So we can go through this calculation assuming the horizontal component will cancel out 
and just to calculate the vertical component, knowing that that will be the only component of the net electric field. So let's go through calculation. The net electric field will be in the y direction. And for the magnitude, we'll have to integrate all the contributions to the y component of the electric field over the entire half ring. So let's write this out. Um, from this point on, I'm just going to write this portion so that I don't have to keep writing down y. So the infinitesimal contribution from the infinitesimal charge, we write it out the same as before, is Coulomb's constant times d cubed over the distance squared. Here, distances are squared. And so far, this is still only a schematic form of integral. We need a way to write out d cubed, express it in terms of something we can parameterize. The theta here is good parameter, so we'll use that. So dq has to be the charge density, lambda, times some length element. Here theta is not the length, it's a small angle. So the arc length that corresponds to d theta should be r times d theta, provided that we are specifying theta in radians. So let's substitute that in. So dq is lambda r d theta. And now we can actually specify the limits of integration. We'll say theta goes from 0 to complete half circle pi. There are already some happy cancellations. So let's note that this factor of r cancels out one factor of r from the denominator. Now, this is the magnitude, but I almost forgot. I have to make sure that I'm taking only the y component of the electric field. So let's write this out. So in terms of the theta, which is our parameter, let me draw this auxiliary figure so that I can label the angles. So that theta is the same theta here. So if you are looking at the y component, looks like this should be de1 sine theta. So let's write that in. To take the y component, we have to multiply this by sine theta. All right, that'll give us something interesting to do for the integration. So let me rewrite this integral, factoring out all the constants so that it's clear uh, what work we have to do. So this the whole thing is equal to ke lambda over r. Here r is a constant because as theta changes, the distance doesn't change. And the remaining integral is theta going from 0 to pi sine theta d theta. Didn't forget anything? Okay. Um, all right. I think I know how to do trig integrals. So let me keep going. The antiderivative of sine is minus cosine. You can always double check your antiderivative by taking the derivative, see if you get the same thing back. And the limits go from 0 to pi. So evaluating at the limit, plug in pi, you get minus 1. So minus minus 1 would be plus 1. Minus, plug in 0, you get 1. So minus 1. Oh, so it's just a 2. 2 ke lambda over r. So that's our electric field. The net electric field is in the y direction with the magnitude 2 ke lambda over r. Let's compare this to the answer we would have gotten if we naively ignore the directions, just for fun. So if we naively ignore the directions, we would have said that the net electric field is KEQ over R squared. To compare to the correct answer, we need to rewrite Q in terms of lambda. Uh, let's do the calculation on the side here. The charge density lambda is equal to the total amount of charge 
divided by the length of the half ring. So that would be pi times r. Or q is equal to pi r lambda. So plugging that in here, you get pi times ke. I'm going to cancel out a factor of r. So just lambda divided by r. So comparing these two answers here, the difference between the naive version and the correct version is factor of pi versus factor of 2. Quite fittingly so, because that's the difference we would have seen if I had forgotten this factor of sine theta. Instead of getting factor of 2 here, I would have gotten factor of pi from doing the d theta integral without sine theta. So that's it. Um, this kind of consideration is something you have seen in a previous lecture video of me doing infinite line, infinite plane, and spherical charge distribution calculation. But this example is nice because the integrals are quite doable. And the only consideration you have to give is the cancellation of different directions to the contribution to the electric field. So this is the last of the charge distributions you have to integrate over. The rest of the homework questions will have you calculate the electric field by using Gauss's law. Bye.